So here we are, I think this is week three of Buddhist studies, is that right? Yeah. Uh, on, a, on the study of the four foundations of mindfulness and Mark's going through the hindrances. I believe last week he spoke of sensual desire and today it's my job to speak about ill will. I worked, some of you know, I've worked in schools for a long time. I work in a high school now, but for a long time, I worked in elementary schools. And this one little buddy that I worked with in kindergarten uh, some years ago, if you know, if you've loved anyone who's been in kindergarten, you know that it's rough in the beginning of the year, especially if um, they haven't done preschool it's so much stimulation and they're just so exhausted, right? Somebody's telling them what to do all the time and all these new rules and guidelines and procedures and just a lot of structure and a lot of kids, right? And everything's loud and they're just tired. Those first couple of weeks of school, I mean, I hear from parents all the time, like kids come home, they either fall apart or fall asleep or stay up too late because they're wired. I mean, it's just difficult. And so for in the beginning of one of the school years, several weeks in, I think um, these two little kindergartners were having daily conflicts and it was my job to sort of help them figure things out. And every time I thought I'd gotten somewhere, then, you know, it really, really wasn't anywhere, <laughs> it does keep going. And, and finally, I think in some exhaustion, but also in a, some real sincerity, I had this one little person in my office and they just started crying and they were, you know, I was like, well, trying to figure out well, what can we do to help you get along better? And they just started crying and they said, but her is so mean. <laughs> her is so mean you know the that kind of uh, real sincere reckoning with the truth of things like i know what you're saying is probably good and i know it will probably help me do better and but it's just so hard because she's so mean right <laughs> and this is this is kind of how we relate to the experience of aversion or ill will a lot of the time. It's, it's so compelling. It's so compelling to meet hate with hate, right? It's, all, it's almost like the mind thinks that there's no other way. Nothing makes sense. Nothing else except this. And the energy can be so seductive that it kind of carries us away. And especially when we're a little bit beat down by the world, beat down by kindergarten, beat down by school, beat down by samsara, beat down by the state of things and with the earth and, you know, all of the suffering that we're, that we know and experience and hear about on a daily basis. And so with this, teaching here about how to relate wisely to the experience of ill will, we start to get curious about that, which the mind assumes, like, is this really the best way? Does this really help? Does engaging with a mind that is, you know, really compelled towards hostility, is that the way to achieve the outcomes that I'm hoping for. <clears throat> and we might not know the answer to that, you know, and that's part of the exploration is to sort of, is to be really honest. So like this little guy, you know, like, well, this is the heart of what's hard for me. The world is mean <laughs> or it's unjust or things are just too difficult, right? So when we can trust this, the heart that knows how to be intimate, we can trust the sensitivity that develops there, then it's with time and patience and practice that we can 
develop the sort of wisdom that aids in the process of being willing to do something else. The heart that knows how to do something else because it's motivated by confidence. Oh, there, I know things work better when I'm not so compelled towards hostility. And so in the four foundations of mindfulness, we, we sort of move through territory. This is where the Buddha, you know, teaches us how to practice and the four foundations. And we move through the gross from the gross to the subtle. So the first foundation is body. And then we have feeling or this understanding of some of the, the building blocks to suffering, the unpleasantness, the pleasantness, what happens, what, what do we do when we encounter unpleasant experience or pleasant experience and then towards the mind mindfulness of mind and then the fourth foundation is uh, mindfulness of dhammas and whereas the first three from the gross to the subtle but also in the first three it's really about what we experience what we meet what we hear and the fourth one is really about process so it's the most subtle and it's really these maps that provide a kind of um, lens that we can see into the process of clinging a little more. So a little with as much hit with everything, right? It actually gives us a way to explore what is this thing that we call a human existence, for example. What is what is this human human being here? Well, you know, some of these max, maps will point that out to us and so that nothing's left out. And with the, the intention of understanding freedom, because this is the Buddha's main objective. How does the, how does the mind participate in its own freedom? So the hindrances, the poly word hindrance gets, the poly word that gets translated as hindrance is actually nivarana. And that word doesn't mean hindrance at all, but it means to cover over, right? Hindrance is a good word because it's really pointing to how there are momentary lapses in mindfulness. And in those moments, the mind becomes hindered or colored with another with a, one of these flavors, right? The, like the flavor of ill will or the flavor of aversion, for example. But Gil Fransdahl, who is a mark, I think is, uh, we had some articles to read, a, a few from Gil, two or three, I think, in this week's teachings. But Gil's a wonderful translator as well as a wonderful Dharma teacher. And so he really makes this point of, mm -hmm the translation being to cover over um, so that we can start to see how, how it's not as scary as it might seem like it would be to connect with the experience of ill will, right? Because isn't that one of the fears? Like if I really open to ill will, I have to, I have to reckon with how messy I am. And that's not easy to do. And for some of us, we start to trust sensitivity and say yes. And in theory, that sounds good. But when we start to see hateful thoughts or really despicable thoughts that we're shocked by, it becomes a little bit hard to be sincere, like as sincere as a little kindergartner, right? It's like, she is so mean. Now we're saying, oh my gosh, I am so mean. <laughs> yeah. So sometimes that hindrance that's there, like the hindrance of aversion, for example, which sometimes that it is, um, people do talk about it as a hindrance of aversion uh, instead of just directly ill will. But sometimes that experience of ill will is actually there for a really good reason, right? Because what it's covering over is something that the heart is quite vulnerable about. Have you ever had the experience of, of immediately feeling angry 
And then when you actually sat with it, you realized that you were hurt or disappointed. Right? And in that moment of anger, without any mindfulness, then we can be compelled to act that out. And that's what we might call ill will. So the good news is that the mind that can observe a hindrance is a mind that is unhindered, right? Because in that moment, mindfulness, sensitivity brings with it a bit of kindness that is able to say yes to that. So we don't have to be so af afraid of what we might see with this exploration. And in fact, it's actually kind of what I feel like is for me has been the uh, one of the real beauties of the path is that this willingness to see into my own messy mind then has just allowed me to greet and meet other people with a little more grace, right? It, it makes it, it just becomes a lot harder to blame or throw anything at another human being when I can see how easy it is to get swept away by the habits of the mind and especially by the hindrances of the mind. This is where we live most of the time in our daily lives. On retreat, we might have this experience of concentration and which the, it feels really pleasant because the hindrances are at bay. But in daily life, it's not so much like that. The territory that we're in is the territory of the hindrances, right? We're watching confusion come and go. We're watching aversion. How many moments of these do we have during our day where there's a bit of frustration, a bit of annoyance, a little irritation, it comes and goes, we're fine, we go back, we find our center and we keep doing our life, right? This happens, doesn't this uh, nod your head if this happens or just me, <laughs> okay. Yeah, so we're in this territory quite a lot. And so this capacity to trust sensitivity and really connect here with any expression of ill will, then supports, really does support our capacity to understand how human beings do the most despicable things. I was just, uh, and this has happened like a million times, but I was having a conversation with my partner who I've been married to for a long time. And we're both practitioners. We both care deeply about living a mindful life. And here we are having this conversation. And I felt a, one of those little irritations. And I felt it come. And in a moment, there was a little bit of wisdom that was there. It was kind of faint, but it was like, sweetie, be careful because this is delicate territory. If you say something, you know, it might hurt her. You'll regret it later. And I watched that like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we stayed in the conversation. And then I just watched myself say the thing that I knew I shouldn't say. <laughs> Have you ever done that? Right. Isn't it humbling? You're like, oh, my God. I was like so mindful. I saw that. The wisdom was there. And then I just did it anyway. Why do we do that? <laughs> well, we do that because the force of mindfulness or mindful awareness or wise awareness is not quite as strong as the force of that habit of the defilement of the habit of ill will, right? That little irritation comes on. There's not enough strength to meet it, to observe it. And it just sweeps us away just like that. And as easy as it is for me to get swept away in a single moment, face to face with this person that I completely love two practitioners do some, you know, the, how, I don't know how much better it could get without anybody around, right? There's no chaos, just us. And if I can't get it together in a moment like that, it makes a lot of sense how human beings make mistakes and some big, terrible mistakes. So this capacity to be courageous and meet the own mess of our minds then allows us to really see the world a little bit differently, right? And that doesn't mean that I should let myself off the hook or that I should 
you know, somehow let these kindergartners just do whatever they want to do because, you know, her is so mean and the world is so hard and kindergarten is so hard. But it just means that I have a little bit of compassion that allows me to engage a little bit more skillfully. Yeah. So in the moment when anger arises as a force of ill will, then I'm, I let that touch my heart and I know, okay, this is a force to be reckoned with. Anger in particular has a very alive feeling, right? If you've gotten angry, angry you know that you might say it's unpleasant, but actually there's a little hook of pleasantness in there that feels it going because it, it has that kind of feeling of aliveness, right? So in a moment like that, then we can, we can choose to uh, engage it with as much skill as we possibly can. Right? Set some boundaries and limits, you know, make sure that I give myself a time out, you know, if that's what I need or take a walk around the block or I say, if I say, you know, I'm, I'm good at this, like I'm really irritated right now. My partner might say, well, let's stop then, right? That's a good, that's in relationship with two people who can honor that expression. And so it doesn't mean we have to stop participating or engaging or taking care of our civic responsibilities or somehow become passive because we understand and we're humbled by the force of ill will. It just means that we have more, to, we have more tools because we're not afraid of it, right? We're not afraid of it. I was on a, a retreat once and I, a, a longish retreat at the forest refuge. And I was really happy to be there and very happy to be uh, practicing with these two teachers that I've been um, hoping to practice with for a while. And if you've practiced at the forest refuge, you know that there's a Dharma, you know, there's not a talk every night. There's not instruction. There's instructions. I, I think every, in this retreat, it was like every other, every other day in a, a Dharma talk every three days or something like that. And so the Dharma talk is like something you really look forward to. It's the entertainment. Otherwise you're just by yourself. <laughs> anyway, that was the way this mind related to it. <laughs> and I got to the entertainment part of the day um, and I was like, yeah, here we go, right? Get some Dharma, break it up, break up the routine. And day after every time for like three or four talks, I would get there and be immediately annoyed. And I was like, what is happening? The mind was irritated about something or criticizing something or judging something or blaming something. And it was just incessant. And, you know, I did what I could do to be with it and it like practice all the, the like just connect, intimate, trust. It's okay. Practice opening my eyes, practice taking deep breaths, letting the energy move, all this stuff. And it just kept coming until eventually the awareness was strong enough to actually see what was fueling it. Like that hindrance was covering up something. And that was this limiting belief that I could never do that. I heard it. It just came in the form of a thought. I could never do that. I could never do that. And it was just fueling that. And as soon as that was caught, it was like, oh, sweetie, All right? There you are again. And I was so, you know, immediately the aversion just dropped away because there was this real ability to be honest, to be sincere. And so many of the, uh, so there's a, a long list, I've just named a few, but of the different expressions of aversion, right? And we might think of, this is how I think about it, like aversion on a spectrum and from minor irritations all the way to rage or terror and then everything in between. 
So although this hindrance is often talked about in two different ways, either aversion or ill will, we can sort of explore the full territory of the mind that is saying no, basically, right? Sensual desire and, and uh, ill will are like two sides of the same coin. Sensual desire is like trying to suck some happiness out of life by through gratification. And ill will is trying to suck some happiness out of the life by pushing something away or getting, getting away from something. Like it's a giant no, not this. And so just to list some of the many expressions, boredom could be one of them. Okay. Hatred, judgment, rage, loathing, self-loathing, any kind of resistance, panic, terror, loneliness could be another one. And if it helps, you can sort of place these, uh, like imagine two buckets, the fear bucket and the, and the hatred and the anger bucket. And, and maybe irritation and annoyance goes in the anger bucket and fear, panic, terror, you know, in another bucket. So one of the, the, the anger bucket is like the lash out bucket and the fear bucket is like get away bucket. So if you notice that instinct to just somehow turn away in a more harsh way, fueled by hostility, then you might, that might be the fear bucket, but just some way to, to look at that. One of the things that I've heard Gil say before that I've really appreciated is that when talking about how um, the hindrances cover over, you know, often what they cover over is something that, uh, yeah. So when we, when we come into the hall, we sit down, we sit with a, right, right beneath the Buddha, the statue of the Buddha, we sit back straight, head up, dignified we come here like we have some reason to be here right that this practice is hard but you know i'm, I'm really gonna do it i'm really gonna sit down i'm gonna feel into the nobility of my being and so this often often that is really hard to feel Right? What we start to feel, how difficult it is to be a human being. And so this covering over the weeds that kind of cover over our, our right to be here, our right to take our seat. And this is what the Buddha discovered on the eve of his awakening, sitting there under the tree, being visited by all the hindrances, right? And he reached down and touched the earth, at the earth as the earth is my witness, right? Because it is hard. It is hard to grapple with the mess of our minds. And so that cover, we might just explore that, what, the, what it means that we're actually doing this most courageous thing, walking this path, being intimate, trusting sensitivity, feeling into all the mess, the aversiveness, the ill will, learning how to take that show on the road in relationship and at work and in the world. That is our spiritual practice asks everything of us, right? It is the hardest thing. We're trying to live by these values that are hard to internalize, much less express. And so every time we sit down, we can feel that. We can just feel into that. Like here I am taking my rightful seat, doing the best that I can, even though it's hard.
Sylvia Borstein said, <clears throat> mindfulness meditation doesn't change life. Life remains as fragile and unpredictable as ever. Meditation changes the heart's capacity to accept life as it is. It teaches the heart to be more accommodating, not by beating it into submission, but by making it clear that accommodation is a gratifying choice. Not by beating it into submission, not by somehow in this condemning ourselves when we start to see all of the despicable thoughts and feelings that might flow through the mind. We can accept that as a part of human nature. It is, you know, what human beings, it's what we do until we know better and learn how to train. And even then we make mistakes. And Gil's translation from the Dhammapada. All experience is preceded by mind, led by mind, made by mind. Speak or act with the corrupted mind and suffering follows. As the wagon wheel follows the hoof of the ox. All experience is preceded by mind, led by mind, made by mind. Speak or act with a peaceful mind and happiness follows like a never departing shadow. They abused me, attacked me, defeated me, robbed me. For those carrying on like this, hatred does not end. They abused me, attacked me, defeated me, robbed me. For those carrying on like this, hatred ends. Hatred never ends through hatred. By non-hate alone does it end. This is an ancient truth. Many do not realize that we here must die. For those who realize this, quarrels end. The very popular and often paraphrased hatred never ceases by hatred. You might have heard that. You know, this is Gill's translation of the Buddha's words here. But the heart has to learn this moment by moment, right? That it doesn't, it doesn't benefit, it doesn't make things better to fight hatred with hatred. And we learn that in very simple moments when we see something in our own hearts and minds that feels difficult to meet. And we learn how to meet that with a little more kindness with a little more patience, with a little less of what Sylvia said, beating it into submission. Thanks for your attention tonight, everyone. <clears throat>